your Bibles to Genesis chapter uh, 25 because we are going to continue in our series uh, titled Reaching Your Destiny. And today is part two and I want to talk to you about hindrances to reaching your destiny. And um, I just want to read you a familiar passage of scripture. Genesis chapter 25, look at verse 29. Jacob cooked a stew, and Esau came in from the field, and he was very weary. And Esau said to Jacob, Please feed me with that same red stew, for I am weary. Therefore his name is called Edom. But Jacob said, Sell me your birthright as of this day. And Esau said, Look, I'm about to die. So what is this birthright to me? And Jacob said, Swear to me as of this day. So he swore unto him and sold his birthright to Jacob. And Jacob gave Esau bread and stew of lentils. Everybody say beans. And then he ate and drank and rose and went his way. Thus Esau despised his birthright. Pray with me. Father, thank you for the reading of the word. I ask you to bless it to the hearing of our ear and the receiving of our heart in Jesus' name. And everyone said... Everybody, listen, there's a phrase that you might be familiar with if you are a reader of the Bible and um, you've been uh, uh, paying attention at any journey in, or any amount of time in your journey with your walk with Christ, you might be familiar with this phrase. God often introduces himself in the scripture as the God of Abraham, Isaac, and this is an introduction. This is a title of God. It's much like Mr. Um, you know, uh, it's, it's much like uh, Professor. It's a, it's a title. It gives him a, a, a point of identity. He is the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Who shall I tell? Tell them that, uh, tell them that the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Y- you will, you, they will know me because of my people. I'm the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And we love that, right? Like that gives us some history of God. That gives us some touching point of God, doesn't it? It it gives us something to go on by who God is. The God of Abraham, Isaac, and... So I read a study uh, in prep for this message. And... um, the study took uh, several children, and it brought several children in and set them down at a table and gave each one of the children a marshmallow. And what the challenge was to, how many of you like, how many of you like marshmallows? Oh, boy. Can you smell them, right? Yeah. What, what the challenge was to these kids were if they could sit for an hour and not eat the marshmallow, at the end of the hour, they would be given another one. <laughs> Rachel's going to eat it? She said Rachel's going to eat it. Rachel, she's got no faith in you. Let me let me tell you something. In the first service, uh, someone actually didn't eat it, but they were licking on it during the service. Uh, was no, 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 uh, no. Lexi said, "What if you eat part of it? You you can't eat it. If you want another one, you can eat it." But you, you can't have another one. If you eat it before the sermon is over, you can't have another one. Look, Donnie's still got, Donnie's got two. <laughs> who, who else likes marshmallows? Oh, here we go, right over here. So, marshmallows. So, the study gave kids marshmallows and said no licking 
Look here. No smelling. No whatever. Can't eat it. No. I'm going to leave the, re the, the ending of the survey for a little bit later. According to the Bible and Hebrew traditions, according to Hebrew traditions, the oldest son, the right of the firstborn, according to Hebrew traditions, in this case Esau, was entitled to inherit everything of significance from his father. Not 60, 40. He gets 60% and the younger brother gets 40. No, according to Hebrew tradition, the older brother gets everything of significance. Everything of significance belongs to him. Now, we under, when we understand this properly and we begin to meditate on what's happening between Esau and Jacob here, and we see what uh, Jacob is really thinking about. Jacob's had his eye on something. Hello, somebody. And Jacob has made a plan. He's developed this plan. I want, I, 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 he gets everything of significance. And we read the story about Esau and we judge him wondering, how could anyone be so not smart? To trade away everything of significance for beans. We're not talking about a ribeye steak. We, we're, not, we're not talking about Come on, beans is what we're talking about here. We're talking about you know, something made up kind of like a can of beanie weenies. Pork and beans. In the, this is what we're talking about. You, you guys have beans here in the north. I, since we've been to the north, we haven't really eaten a lot of beans. You got beans here? You got like pinto beans? Right? You got like, uh, uh, what kind of beans are there? Uh, you got lima beans? Oh, right? Like, I miss lima beans. Do you eat lima beans in the north? Yeah? Oh, I miss lima beans. You know the great thing about beans? You can flavor beans any way you want to. You can't hardly mess beans up. You can put bacon in beans. You can put hot dogs in beans. You can put... Okay, maybe we won't put marshmallows in beans. You can put ham hocks in beans. Oh, come on now. Smoked ham. Not just any. You got to put smoked ham hocks in there. Oh, man. And the gravy off the lime. Of, hello, Jesus. That's what I'm talking about. How could anybody make such a silly decision in this moment in time? How could anyone trade away his birthright for a bowl of beans? Really, beans are good, but they're not that good. They're really not that good. And even the scripture says it's not all common for people to trade destiny for beans. Come on. I mean, we just look at Esau and we think, how could he do it? But it's not uncommon for people to do it every day. The insignificant things that we trade for the most significant things. And the Bible warns us, it says, lest there be any fornicator or profane person like Esau. Hello, somebody. Who for a morsel of food sold his birthright. We know that afterwards he wanted to inherit the blessing but was rejected. He found no place for repentance, though he sought it diligently with tears. You see, we need to understand the story more and how we are tempted to behave in the same way. And the Bible shows us very clearly that there are a whole bunch of people in the Bible that trade their destiny for beans. Yes, there are. Adam and Eve. Come on. Now, we're not talking about struggle here. 
They lived in perfect harmony with everything. The lion laid down with the lamb. Everything was in order. Everything was in its place. There was no pop bottles to pick up. Hello, somebody. There was no junk to pick. There was no garbage to take out. There was none of that kind of. Everything was in it. There was no, there was no weeds in the garden. You didn't have to get out a hole. Everything was in its place. Everything was in its order. So it wasn't like there was a struggle. And all of a sudden, we give Eve all the grief in the world for taking a bite of the forbidden fruit. But what we don't understand is that Adam was standing right there. It wasn't like he was somewhere else when Eve was having a conversation with this serpent. He was there because when she ate, the Bible speaks, and it says she turned to her husband. He's right there to tell him it was good. He never put a stop to any of this. He never never intervened in any way. Instead, they traded away perfection. They traded away the garden. They traded away fellowship with God every day. For what? Beans. David and Bathsheba. Hello, somebody. It was a time of war. David should have been out on the battlefield with his soldiers. That's where the king was supposed to be, overlooking and watching the battle. Instead, David was back home being lazy with binoculars on his roof. Come on. And I guarantee you this, the Bible tells us about this story, but I bet it wasn't the first time he was on that roof with binoculars. Well, bless you something, young men. Hello, somebody. You know what you're supposed to be doing? Instead, you're over there looking at stuff you ain't supposed to be looking. It's called Beans. And it's so prevalent in our world today that we just become callous to it. You know why? Because, see, over and over and over and over and over, we are indulged with it through media, through social media, through everything that's going on in the world around us, and we become callous to it. But celebrities celebrities trade it all the time. They trade the goodness of their life for beans. Listen, I'm a sports guy. I love everything sports. Ask my wife. And I see these top echelon athletes who have been given everything and who who could make such a powerful difference in the world around them. Instead, they trade everything they've been given them for what? And you can't tell me that they aren't dedicated men and women because they have sacrificed their lives. They have given everything to be at the top level of athletic paralysis. And they have gotten to the top. They know what it takes to sacrifice. Yet when they get there, hello, somebody. They throw it away for alcohol. They throw it away for drugs. They throw it away for sex. They throw it away for beans. And I don't know about you, but every day when I listen to the sports radio or turn on the sports news, I just go, gosh, what we could do with the money that they have just traded away. What we could do, the lives we could change. Beans! Every time it happens. And so my question to us this morning is, what are the beans of our lives? All right, it's it's one thing to talk about sports and celebrities and and all the the things that they throw away, but sometimes our beans, they, they might not even be bad things. You might be so hooked on reruns of Bonanza that you can't even clean the house. You might be so addicted to a slop opera, I mean a soap opera, Listen, them people done died and resurrected more times than Jesus. I mean, 30 years ago when I was having to watch it as a kid, they died in a car accident. I turned it on. They're still alive. How did they come back from the dead? Who 
so addicted to slop operas. Transpose that kind of lifestyle onto your own family and marriage, and it's a wonder. What, hello, somebody. It's called beans. Maybe the wrong kind of movies. Maybe the wrong kind of music. Maybe the hobbies. They can take our time away from God, away from, from a, him, a, who we are and our destiny. They can rob us of those things. And I'm going to say something super churchy and super church cliche this morning. But God has a special purpose and a destiny for us. Let me, let me just reiterate this to you because I, I want to drop a heavy on you this morning. I really do. I want, I want this to sink into your mind. And, and, and I wanted to, to just... Rachel, you're not licking that thing, are you? Okay. And Cassie is like protecting hers over there. She's just like... Nobody said that Rachel couldn't eat Cassie's. Hmm. <laughs> let me, let me, I, want to, I want to drop you something to think about this morning I really want you to meditate on this Because you, maybe you've never thought of Maybe you have As the firstborn Esau should have inherited Physically and spiritually the blessing Are we good with that? Right? Like we're, we're not arguing that point He should have inherited the most property He should have inherited the primary blessing For his descendants Think about that It's not only a blessing for him But it was a blessing for his children And let me tell you something parents You might be so so bent on eating your beans You don't realize You're not only selling your destiny down the tubes You're selling your children's destiny down the tubes Because you got to have those beans He wasn't thinking about his descendants. It should have blessed not only his children, but his children's children. It was the blessing. It was the blessing that he should have ended up in the line of the Messiah. Listen to me. Beans cost Esau the right to be in the lineage of Christ. Think about your term. He is the God of Abraham, Isaac, and It's not what it should have said. He should be known as the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Esau. Hello, somebody. You see, I don't know about you, but I'm in this place where I'm beginning to grab a hold of of the things that I trade tomorrow for the, the beans of today. Think about this. The Bible uses this term that we embrace so powerfully. It's God's identity. It's who he is. No other God can be described as the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. No other God that's ever, ever been worshipped on this earth can be described. When you say the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the whole world knows which one you're talking about come on of all the gods that are worshipped in this world we all know there's only one anyway but it doesn't matter talk to a pagan talk to someone when you say the God of Abraham Isaac and Jacob they know you're talking about Elohim they know that but he should not be known as the God of Abraham Isaac And Jacob, he should be known as the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Esau. It's right there in the book. I don't have a trick Bible. It's right there. And he traded that for beans. He made a trade Beans for blessing, beans for destiny. He traded temporary pleasure for long-term success. He gave into today's temptation and destroyed tomorrow's destiny. He shunned self-control and chose temporary fulfillment for, for a moment in time. He didn't think or care about the future. We wonder why our lives are a mess. Because we are a consumer of beans. We can't stop consuming it. You know, you know why one of the, you know why this area is one of the most blessed and famous areas in the world. I, I, I saw it. I, I would have never ever thought about it or knew it if I hadn't. It was on National Geographic. They actually said something good. They said that this area of North America, because of the seed corn production. 
Do you know that this area is made famous because we don't consume corn? But because we raise the seed to send out around the world so they can consume. This area is famous not only for that, but here's what National Geographic also said. They said that during the seed corn growing season, that this area of North America produces more oxygen than the rainforest does in one year. From corn. Because we're not consumers of it. Not totally. This area, this area in the world is producing more oxygen just during the season of growing corn. What is this, May to October? Is that okay? Then the rainforest does in a year's time. That's a good thing, church. That's a really good thing. All of the tree huggers should be really happy about all the corn we grow around here. Many of us, to a greater or lesser degree, trade our destinies and future for consumption right now. And it's up to each of us to make a decision to trade the temporal pleasures for long-term gain. See, you ever heard that scripture where God says you got to work out your salvation with fear and trembling? Have you ever read that scripture? Now, if you're a Bible reader, if you're a Bible studier, for, 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 you know, for me, I... I, I want to be a man of grace. And that scripture itself flies in the face of the teaching of grace because Ephesians teaches me that, you know, that salvation is the free gift of God. You, you can't earn it. You can't do anything to earn it lest you should boast and say you know, that you did it on your own. It's the free gift of God. That's what Ephesians teaches us, doesn't it? Yeah, it does. It absolutely teaches us that. But then there's a scripture in the New Testament where we are encouraged to work out our salvation with fear and trust. How does that work? How do the two balance? Well, if you get your theological mind thinking like you should, you'll understand the scripture's not talking about earning salvation. It's talking about working out your own salvation because of what God is working in you. I, I, deliverance, we all want to be delivered from something. We all got beans. We want to be delivered from those things. But see, what I learned through my own deliverance is not only did God deliver me, but I had to walk out deliverance. Not only was God working right in me, but I had to work it out what God was working in me. You got to work out what God is working in. Hello, church. You got to decide to get serious about your destiny. Because God is serious about it. You want me to tell you how serious God is about it? He's so serious about it that he would allow himself to be known as the God of Abraham, destined man. Isaac, destined man. And Jacob, hungry to be destined man. Let me figure it out. Now, God had to change Jacob in a lot of ways. Hello, somebody. I mean, his name literally means cheater. That's what Jacob means. You cheat. You usurper. Hello, somebody. So God had to change him to, we know, we know him as, come on, Bible people. What did God change Jacob's name to? Israel. Israel. God's work. See, he had to work out what God was working this is so good. See, see, God will meet us, but he requires us to take the initiative and he requires us to exercise our own will to work out what he is working in. Rob had no idea that I was going to share the prodigal a little bit this morning. He had no idea. But I sat and listened to him and I was just like, man, it's so good. This guy, he must have read my notes or something. I don't know, but he's, he's not on my email when I first sent it out, you know, to all the, the, the media people and all that good stuff to get it on the web page. So he couldn't have read my notes. But in the story of the prodigal son, the father literally permitted the son to be a person of beans. He didn't force his own will onto him. And the, the, the younger son came to his father and said, give me my portion. Now, I don't know how much that was, but it couldn't have been much. Because everything else, everything belonged to the older son. 
That's the tradition. It couldn't have been much. I don't know how all that works out and all those things, but whatever it was that he got, the father gave him freedom to make his own choice. And when the son realized he was no longer in a position to reach his destiny, instead what he was doing is eating with pigs. He made a choice to return to his father, not as a son, but as a slave. And, and, and Rob said it very, very powerfully this morning. He said it very, as soon as the father saw the son had decided to repent and return, the father came running to him. Let's say, let's say you've been trading your destiny for beans. So how do you get back on track? That's a good question. And I got a very simple answer. I'm a simple guy. Let's start with obedience. The Bible says that God prefers obedience over sacrifice. God prefers it. That is, that's where God is at. What has God's word and spirit been saying to you? You know God's been speaking to you. Even now this morning, as I've been talking about beans, you've been thinking about that bean. You've been thinking about that bowl. You've been thinking, yes, you have. Come on. We've all been thinking about it. Lord, I'm tired of eating. But come on, somebody. You have your own destiny to reach. And God wants to partner with you to reach it. Listen, when you go after your destiny, you have a partner in God. God has a destiny for each of us, and it's a significant, it's, it's, it, it includes being a significant contributor to people around you. Think about how blessed this area is because of how we contribute to the world. Come on. Think about it. Because of the corn and the beans. Come on, you hunters. Think how blessed you are. Because of the corn farmers to big, healthy deer. Now we're all getting ready for bow season, I know, right? We're, we're all doing, you know, rows with the dumbbells so we can pull our bows back, right? right? Getting ready. Because we got pictures of that big old brute that's been eating the farmer's corn all summer long. Hey, some of you, some of you detasselers, you ever run into the deer in the fields? Right? Crazy, right? They'll like run you over. Not good. You don't weigh as much as they do. We're so blessed because of the contribution that we give to others. Think about how it works. See, God has a destiny for each of us, and it includes being a contributor into others' life during this life, leading others to Christ and populating heaven. Do you understand that's part? That's our responsibility to populate heaven. Jesus opened the door. Our job is to bring people and populate That's part of our destiny, our own blessing and our own significance. And I'm telling you what, you never find significance in your life until you stop living for yourself. When you start living for other people, you begin to find significance. And I'll challenge you. I'll challenge you. You get in those deep, dark depression modes and, and you can't break out. All you want to do is hide in the closet or hide under the bed. Let me tell you how to break out of that. Get yourself up. Get yourself dressed and find somebody to serve. Because all you're doing is thinking about yourself. Woe is me, woe is me. And don't tell me there's no place to serve because you can walk down there in that nursing home and read a book all day long. There's all kind of ways to serve people. And you find significance in giving your life away. That's why Jesus said when a man tries to save his life, he actually loses it. But when he gives it away, that's when he finds what significant life really means. That's destiny, giving ourselves away, the overflow of our lives and creating the greatest harvest the earth has ever seen in the aspect of the kingdom of God. Romans says, for whom the Lord loved, he chastens, right? There's, there's, God is working inside of us, every son whom he receives. You know, if you endure chastening, God deals with you as a son, so there are keys to reaching destiny, right? We've got to know we have one. In most Christian, modern-day Christian world, I mean, people could give a flip. I'm just going to show up on Sunday. I'll see you next week. Right? 
You've got to develop this relationship with God. And I, I'm really concerned at such a shallow relationship with God in our lives that we don't understand that God is speaking destiny to us every day, every day, every day. And we've got to keep our eye on what God is speaking. We've got to keep focused on what God is saying. We've got to learn to practice self-deny by saying no to beans. Listen to me, church. The best thing beans can do for you is give you gas. We got to fix our eyes on Jesus. That's what the Bible encourages us to do. Therefore, we also, since we are surrounded by a great cloud of witness, let us lay aside all the beans. Lay them aside. Get rid of those things. Those things which easily ensnare us and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us and fix our eyes on Jesus. What are those things that hinder you? You know, we need to know and we need to believe that we have the power of God to resist temptation. What are those things that hinder you? You know what? I don't have to go through them. What, what are they? You know where you're at. You know the beans you've been struggling with. Come on. You know the things that are costing you. Let me tell you something. Right now, young people, right now is the time to decide you're never going to eat them. Never going to sell myself out. No relationship is worth it. Do you understand that? Because all it is a bowl of beans. You're going to wind up with the wrong bowl. Your beans ain't going to have no ham hocks in them. Just going to tell you. Now's the time, parents, to decide I'm not selling my kids and their destiny. Come on. I'm not selling them down. Not for this. Not for that. You know how much you know how much you know how many times Pastor Don gets in trouble because I challenge people about beans? Well, it just goes on. I just can't believe how mad people get at me. It's that important? Some liberty or freedom you feel like you have that's costing you this, that, or the other, it's that important to you. It's not a liberty at all, my friend. Liberties don't chain me down. Come on, somebody. Liberty set me free. Liberties don't cost me my future. Hello, somebody. How many times have our police officers in, in church here encountered people on a daily basis whose lives are ruined because of beans? It's not worth it. It's just not worth it. We need to know beyond a shadow of a doubt. You know what the Bible teaches? No temptation is overtaking you except the one that's common to man. You're not special. Everybody's tempted. And it's not a sin to be tempted. You're not going through something that nobody else has ever had to experience, right? Even Jesus himself was tempted in every way just like us. And you go, oh, no, no, Jesus was never tempted like this. Sure he was. That's how come he can relate to us. You think, oh, no, Pastor Don, you don't know what I'm tempted of. Jesus would never be tempted. Sure he was. Do you know Jesus was offered beans? Sure he was. Did you ever read about Jesus in the wilderness? The Spirit of God led Jesus out there, not Satan. The Spirit took Jesus out in the wilderness, and Satan showed up with beans. Hey, Jesus, how about fall down and worship me, and I'll give you all of this. And Jesus was like, what? You mean you're going to give me what's already mine? No, I ain't eating your beans. Come on, I'm not eating your beans. You see, we've got to live that way. Satan's trying to promise you anything and everything, and you've got to realize God's already given you the greatest blessing in the world. What are you trying to talk me out of? We, we need to know then, believe that we have the power of God over, uh, to resist temptation. Listen, we also need to know and believe God provides all the help we need in order to do it. He says, as his divine power has given to us all things that pertain to life and, and godliness through the knowledge of him that called the glory and virtue by which have been given Jesus the exceeding great precious promises. God's given us all things. You lack nothing. To live for Christ.
I see we, we think, I oh, we have a shortcut in the process here. I'm hungry. I got these beans. I got to take these beans. And our lives are miserable. We sell out for nothing. And I want you to understand something. I have decided in my life that I want God's title to be known as he's the God of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Don. That's me. I want that to be God's title. He's Don. Listen, he's Don's God. Right? There he is. That's who he is. I'm not trading my birthright for beans. I want him to be known that way. Come on, church. That's the way we got to let God be known. He's the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He should have been Esau. I'm not beating up on Jacob. I'm really not. Jacob wanted the blessing more than he wanted beans. I'm not beating up on him. And I'm not really beating up on Esau. I'm just saying, we read a little Bible story and we think, oh, that's just a little story to try and tell us, you know, we, we are, you know, we, we, we ought to be good. We aren't, not do certain things. But we don't realize that it cost Esau to be included in the lineage of Christ. It cost him everything. And the Bible says he sought with tears and found no help in it. Back to my experiment. Oh, he cheated. He cheated. This is how you deal with temptation. You just go to bed. Hey, you know what? Some people should do that. Let me tell you about my experiment. I read this survey. They brought these children in, and they set them down at the table, and they gave them a marshmallow. And they said, if you can not eat this marshmallow for one hour... We will give you two. But if you want to eat the marshmallow, you can eat the marshmallow. You just don't get another one. To a child. They followed these children for 30 years. This was a 30-year study. To a child. Every one of them who ate the marshmallow before the hour was over, accomplished nothing in their life. To a child, everyone who waited to get the second marshmallow became a a CEO, became someone who made a great impact in the world. To a child, they followed these people for 30 years. Think about this. Did you eat the marshmallow? You didn't eat the marshmallow. So if I give you another one, are you going to eat them both? Are you going to give one away? You're going to give, oh, look at there. We might have a CEO there. Right? Rachel, did you lick it? You sure? Did you eat Cassie's? You didn't? Right? Here. Here, just just take them all. You don't get any. Think about this experiment. We see those who are willing to postpone temporal pleasure for long-term gain. Here's my question to you. Are you a one marshmallow person or two? See, you got to make your own choice between beans and destiny. And the greatest hindrance to destiny is a bowl of beans. Watch this. Let me read this to you. 
Come on up here and play softly if you can. In Ezekiel chapter 37, verse 1, watch this. The hand of the Lord came upon me and brought me out in the spirit of the Lord and set me down in the midst of a valley, and it was full of bones. And he caused me to pass by them all around, and behold, there was many in the open valley, and indeed they were very dry. And he said to me, Son of man, can these bones live? So I answered, O Lord God, you know. And again he said to me, prophesy to these bones and say to them, O dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Thus saith the Lord God to these bones, surely I will cause breath to enter into you and you shall live. I will put sinew on you and bring flesh upon you, cover you with skin and put breath in you and you shall live. Then you shall know that I am the God of Abraham. Isaac and Jacob and Donnie and Rachel and Ethan. Come on, and Mike, and Sam and Joe. Because God wants to be known by our destiny. That's so, listen, God can breathe life into dry, dead bones. And God can breathe life back into your lost dreams and hopes. Yes, he can. Yes, he can. But you got to stop eating those beans. You can't do it. You got to stop trading. You got to stop trading. Stand with me. At 4 o'clock this afternoon, we're going to gather together and we're going to see some people make a public declaration that they're not eating beans no more. I want you to come and be a part of it. To me, it's incredible to look back from the lake at all the people on the hill watching those make that public declaration. Let's enjoy our destiny together, some time together. Between now and then, though, I want you to take the hand of the person next to you. And once more, I'm going to pray over us as a church. The sun would go down on taking the time. And we we will do it if we have to, if we need to, if we, listen, to pray for every bowl of beans in this place. The sun would go down. But what we're going to do is we're going to embrace each other. And we're going to find the embrace of God in it. Let's pray. Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. We pray to you right now. In the precious name of Jesus. And during this morning, you have revealed to each and every one of us. That bowl of beans. It cost us God. And it caused. What we thought would be destiny to be a. Valley of dry bones. But this morning in the name of Jesus I prophesy life. Into every lost dream. I prophesy life into every destiny of God right now. Let your spirit come and just breathe, Jesus. Just breathe life back into those things. Lord Jesus, just have your way. Let the world see that you are a God who breathes life into that which has none, into that which looks hopeless. You have destined us, God. Forgive us, Lord, for trading our destiny for something so meaningless, so insignificant as a bean. Lord, today, thank you for revealing to us the significance of the destiny you have for us. As individuals, as families, as a church, God, we embrace it. We embrace it. And, Lord, we stand as sinew and flesh. Return to lost hopes and dreams. 
As breath enters back in, God, and life returns, we pray it right now in Jesus' name. Let your glory come. Lord, some have lost so much. Some have sacrificed so much, God, that hope seems destitute. But that's the mystery of hope, isn't it? You would give us hope in the midst of hopeless times that you would be our hope, Jesus. And so I pray, I pray for prodigal children right now in Jesus' name. I just, I just speak life in Jesus' name. Pray for families and marriages right now. I pray for sickness and disease right now in the name of Jesus. Let life come. Have your way as we embrace who you are, Lord. As we push aside beans for destiny. Let the story be told of your glory. We pray it in Jesus' precious name. And everyone said? I want to challenge you this week. Sit down with each other. Have a conversation, a, a godly conversation about how you can help one another with this issue of beans. I challenge you to have a conversation with co-workers and family and friends about where they're at and the beans that are in their life. Watch what God will do with it. Amen. Give the Lord a hand of praise. Turn around and tell someone you love them.